In this video, we're gonna be going over security and privacy online and really how to properly do this. And it's not gonna be just a VPN ad like almost every other YouTube video out there. I'm gonna be going over five parts that are essential to understanding how to be secure and private online. And that's gonna be your operating system, your DNS server that you're gonna use. And if you don't understand that term, that's okay. This is Beginner Monday, so I'm gonna break down everything that I possibly can for you. Number three is gonna be web browsing, which web browsers to use. Number four is gonna be using VPN and proxy services. And then number five is gonna be search and social networks. So with all this, you should have a lot better understanding of security and privacy online. So let's go ahead and jump into this. So the first thing I'm going over in this one is your operating system. No shocker here, I love Linux for a reason, and that is because it is a secure and private operating system. There's a whole bunch of things that go into Linux, I'm not, not gonna go into those in this video, but many people use Microsoft Windows. Now, there's a whole variety of reasons why I don't like it, but it doesn't make for a very good foundation because they've been proven to have NSA backdoors, there's a telemetry service that is enabled on default that goes ahead and reports all the things that go on with your system back to Microsoft. The default stock settings also enable uh, keystroke logging and they send this back for uh, Cortana and understanding how humans type better. All these things get transmitted to Microsoft. So that's why I really, really don't like Microsoft Windows when it comes to security or privacy. And some of the hardest jobs in the world, in my opinion, are trying to secure Microsoft Windows networks. But with that said, some people are going, well, Titus, I don't know anything else and I, I don't have the time or the knowledge to bother with Linux. I'm like, hey, I get it. And if that's your camp, but you still want to be secure and private, I say, your next best thing would be using a live USB and booting into something called Tails. Now, Edward Snowden actually talked about using Tails and how good it is. And basically what it is, is it's a, a basic operating system. It's Linux, but it has a ability to where basically it's, it's not storing any persistent data, which means everything you do on that, as soon as you go turn off your computer, is pretty much gone. It's not persistent, which is great. I'll go ahead and show you the actual burning the thumb drive using uh, very basic software on Windows so you could at least get uh, tails running on your system when you want to be secure online. I think this is very important. However, I do encourage you try out some of the Linux distributions out there and get off of Windows if you can. I've made a lot of videos which uh, if you check out my channel's playlists, uh, a lot of them going from Windows to Linux and what to expect because it is a whole new operating system. It's very difficult for some people to learn and I try to make a lot of educational content to help you. But with that said, I know Tails would be a very good band-aid and also kind of introduce you to Linux and a lot of the security and privacy features it offers. So uh, I'll leave a link in the description uh, how to get to Tails, but basically uh, downloading an image file, installing it on a USB and then booting from it. And I'll just go ahead and break that down on my desktop here in screen record so you can see all of that. All right, so let's start out here by downloading Tails for the actual uh, live USB, if you're interested in this. If not, check the description. You can go ahead and skip to the next section as well. So with this, we'll have Tails. Uh, it's kind of a weird address, tails.boem.org, and you'll just pick your OS that you're in and then get the image. So we'll go ahead and say install from Windows because that's what most people will probably be using. Let's go and then just download the USB image. Note, their download servers are rather slow. It takes a couple hours to download it here. You may want to do torrenting. If, if you're uncomfortable with that, then just wait a couple hours. So with that image downloaded, we'll close out. Uh, I'm gonna use Etcher for this tutorial because it's just so stupid simple that pretty much anyone can use it. So with Etcher launched, you can go ahead and select your image, you'll click Tails, which you just downloaded, you'll put in your USB drive. Now, 
This is the important thing. If you're doing a live USB drive, I highly recommend using what's called USB 3. If you have a little bit of a newer PC, you should have a USB 3 drive. Now, uh, what a USB 3 drive looks like is right there. You can kind of make it out. It's got that blue line. If it's just got black here, if this is just black, then it's USB 2. And USB 2 drives are pretty slow in comparison. If you plug this USB 3 drive into a USB 3 port on a computer, it's literally going to run and transfer data 10 times as fast. Really important to know. And with that, just click flash, go through the whole process, it validate. Once that's done, take out your USB thumb drive and plug it into either the computer you're running it on, or if it is this computer, you can simply reboot and We'll go ahead and cut over to uh, the reboot process. I have a screen capture device so we can actually show you me booting directly to this thumb drive. All right, and start up here, I'm gonna hit F11. Now my inside computer actually is F12. I've even seen computers do F8 for a boot menu like this. Mileage will vary depending on your computer, but most have a boot menu. If you can't find your boot menu, uh, usually delete or F2 will get you in your BIOS and you can manually select to boot from your USB drive. So with all that said, we'll just arrow down to our USB drive and select that. We're presented with our boot screen. You don't need troubleshooting mode, you just need the first option. Okay, here's our startup screen for Tails. We simply just, you know, select your language. If it's any different from English and hit start tails, this starts into the tails environment. Now, the cool thing about this and also something to remember when you get to the desktop, it's uh, whatever you put on here is going to disappear when you reboot. This is not persistent storage, which means it's dynamic. If you have a power outage and in the middle of something, guess what? When it comes back up, it's going to be exactly like this. It doesn't store anything. So really important to know that up front. But that's also kind of the beauty of Tails and why so many people use it. So from here, you can click Applications and select what you actually want to launch into. Most people are using this for the Tor browser. Use Tor. I'm about to get into that. It's, it's probably the most recommended for security and privacy browsing, but you'd launch into here, launch into your Tor, and browse a lot more secure than if you opened up your Google Chrome and uh, launched into that using your Windows machine. So from here, we would have the internet and, and be able to uh, browse around, do whatever we need to do. So you can come into this and, and just type what is this rash? And this wouldn't show up in your internet history. That's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> but that's the power of Tails and uh, in combination with mainly the Tor browser. So that is the basics for the operating system type of thing. Now, if you say, you know what, I, that's too much above my head. I can't do that. I'll be like, hey, no problem. Look at my videos about at least disabling telemetry and mitigating some of the feedback you submit to Windows. Uh, at least, you know, not submitting like handwriting and speech and a lot of these things to Microsoft will definitely help with your privacy. But again, using Windows is a concern for pretty much anybody in the security field. So number two is going to be DNS servers. And what a DNS server does is it resolves domain names to numbers. So google.com has what's called an IP address or a number. And every time you type it in, it uses this server to figure out what that number is. Now, if you don't do anything in your stock settings, your, your internet service provider will do this service for you, which is extremely bad on a whole bunch of levels. Now, there's a security and privacy aspect because a lot of times they're in bed with uh, reporting you to, let's say you download an illegal song or something like that. That all gets reported and tracked a lot of times through the DNS servers, uh, among other services that you use, by no means just changing your DNS is enough, but it's one of the ways that is tracked. And then also uh, a lot of them can turn over information or they're, they're actually logging all this and 
some of that could be turned over to like the NSA, for example. So using these services is not secure, but honestly, uh, the bigger concern when it comes to ISP or internet service provider DNS servers is they're extremely slow performing and they simply go down sometimes. They're, they're unreliable, which is horrible. Uh, that's my primary reason for never using them, whether it's business, personal, I don't use an internet service provider DNS. And if yeah, you find an IT professional that says, well, you should, they probably aren't a professional. <laughs> so I recommend either using probably Cloudflare or you can use, uh, which Cloudflare is 1.1.1.1, or you can use uh, the 4.9s or even Google DNS would be a step up from your ISP. Now, Google, obviously, for security and privacy, I wouldn't use them, but I just wanted to throw that out as a lot of IT professionals do use Google, which is 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. um, and if you don't understand those numbers, that's okay. Uh, let me go ahead and jump over on the desktop, show you how to set your DNS with these uh, out of the way, and you've set your DNS. Now, preferably, I would set the DNS in the router level. I'd love to show you that, but the problem is everyone's internet service provider is different and everyone's routers are different. So I can't really show you that, but I can show you from a device level. So let's jump over on the desktop and I'll show you setting your DNS. Okay, for setting your DNS in Windows, my high recommendation here would just be to right click on the Windows icon, hit run, and type ncpa.cpl. This launches an old school network configuration that makes it really easy to modify the DNS in a Windows based system. We'll right click on our loaded or connected Ethernet adapter, hit properties, and then what I like to do is disable IPv6 and then go over to IPv4 and hit properties and say DNS use this server. And then for alternative, I like to do nines and this gives a very secure, high performance DNS server. We'll hit, go ahead and hit apply and close out. So you can also check to see what your DNS server is by going run and we'll just launch in a command prompt and do an IP config all. And you'll see that our DNS servers right here is the 1.1.1 and the 9.9.9. Now, if there is some cache, you can also clear this out. And what cache is, is let's say you're going to sites and all of a sudden you're like, ah, it's still using this old DNS. You might also just for security's sake do IP config flush DNS. This forces all the DNS on this computer to be basically repopulated with using the new DNS server. So I highly recommend flushing the cache as well after establishing the new DNS servers on Windows. So with the DNS set, you are now routing your traffic through a high performing, good, secure DNS server that's not constantly tracking and sending all this stuff back. These are two very good things. So now we can move on to web browsers. Ah, this is a, such a landmine when it comes to, to web browsers as well. So web browsers, you see a whole bunch of stuff. I even did a video on the Brave browser not too long ago. And the Brave browser is based on Chromium, which Chrome is based on Chromium. It's actually a Google product. So I don't consider these that secure or private, even though both security and privacy is like all over their main pages. Their code base is still Google. Now on the flip side, you have Firefox, which is made by Mozilla. And again, I know there's some reporting and stuff going on here in the shenanigans background. So you got kind of like, it's hard to be secure or private with either one of these browsers in my opinion. The only browser I'd really trust if I was worried about security and privacy would be the Tor browser. The Tor browser I think has everything when it comes to anonymity that I really am searching for in a web browser. So if that's your main focus, Tor browser is where it's at. Now for me personally, I don't really like the Tor browser that much. I know it's based on Firefox and most people that follow the channel know I'm not a huge fan of Firefox. I know, don't don't stone me to death here. I know I just said that, but uh, the Tor browser is the best, but it is based on Firefox and 
I don't like a lot of the layout. So with that, I went with Vivaldi, which is based on the Chromium. So it has a Google code base to it, which is very frowned upon for security and privacy. Uh, but they do have some very good privacy features and is far better than using Google Chrome and a lot better than using just Chromium, which is the open source version of uh Google Chrome. So uh, with those out of the way, I personally use Vivaldi uh, because I really like the privacy aspects of it. It's not great, but at the same time, it's a lot better than everything else that's using Google Chrome. Um, Brave also is pretty decent on this. I think Vivaldi's just a hair better, uh, but Brave, a lot of people love just because of uh, the cryptocurrency and being able to pay uh, certain creators for their contributions. And it has a really neat uh, ecosystem, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. For this security and privacy only, I'd only recommend really the Tor browser if that's your main focus. But if you still have to have that Google ecosystem, Vivaldi, I I'm really starting to warm up more towards. And uh, that's kind of my go-to when it comes to security, privacy, on the Google code base. But I wanted to give those two choices, choose which one's right for you. Next up is gonna be VPNs and proxies. Oh boy, this one. I don't ever listen to any YouTuber when it comes to a VPN or proxy, including me. Do your own research because I gotta tell you, up front, we get paid tons in affiliate revenue off VPNs and proxies. That's why you're always seeing in VPN ads and people shilling VPN services. As example, my VPN that I've used for three years and what I currently use is private internet access. They're right now, I think $40 a year. I get paid like 10 bucks or something crazy off of that. It's like 25% if you sign up with private internet access. That's an insane commission. So no, I'll leave the link in the description, but if you click that, I'm getting paid. Now I say that because most of the ones that have affiliate revenue, all the other ones out there have the same type of system, um, reside in what's called the Five Eyes country or countries with really high surveillance like United Kingdom, United States, Canada, Australia, um, the list goes on and on, and, and that's been expanded and expanded, and most people are very uncomfortable with a lot of these big VPN providers that reside in these countries or are at least headquartered in them. So as far as the VPN that would be the most secure and private that doesn't reside in the Five Eyes countries, which I've already kind of touched on that, which, you know, U.S., United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, those surveillance type countries, you would probably need to look at Proton VPN. They don't have an affiliate link. You just need to Google them, Proton VPN. They know they reside in one of these neutral countries. They are pretty expensive. They're about a hundred dollars a year, so more than double most of our the the VPN services that everyone says is the best. Um I don't subscribe to this theory, but I at least wanted to present it to you because I think it's very important to, so you know everything about a VPN provider. Not all of them are created equal, and this is one of the ones that I think focuses more on anonymity and also just being able to sign up using whatever. I mean, I know on Proton VPN, I think you can use cryptocurrency and don't even need to use your real name, which I think... <laughs> That's, it goes a long ways to, to be private and secure online. Now, as far as proxy services, a lot of times they have bundled services. Now, you can mix and match some of these to where you could do a VPN to this provider and then do a proxy service to another one. And VPN and proxies are pretty much the same thing. Again, uh, a VPN, you know, you have you, you connect to your VPN and then all your traffic goes out. Same thing with a proxy. It goes the same way, it come over to the proxy server and out, but uh, proxies are unencrypted between you and the proxy server where a VPN is encrypted. So that's the differences between proxies and VPNs 
and you can double up. A lot of times those that are really paranoid about this will first establish connection with the VPN and then do a jump over to a proxy. So they'll do the VPN connection and then actually connect to a proxy and do basically two jumps. So if someone traces them back, they'll trace back to the proxy first and then go from the proxy to the VPN and then finally from the VPN to the actual uh, person behind there. So yes, it can be done, uh, but again, it definitely makes your footprint a lot smaller and definitely uh, makes you a bit more secure in private. So this brings us to our last point. Security and privacy when it comes to search and social networks. So what happens after you get your perfect setup? You got your Linux OS, you're connecting through a secure DNS server, you, you're using Tor browser, and then also you have your VPN established and you've connected to a proxy. The absolute quadrifecta. <laughs> is that even a thing? Is, is quadrifecta a thing? I don't think it's a thing, but it should be. Um, you, you're all set up. You're as secure and private as you can based on this video. And then you go do something silly like sign into your Facebook. You're killing me, man. You're, you're, why even bother with all this crap? You're basically just handing out all of your information by doing social networking. I mean, it, it kills me. I see this all the time. Like they'll go through all this trouble, establish like all these VPNs, they'll use the tails, they'll use all this stuff. And then they'll go connect using their real name to an actual service. And I'm just like, oh, uh, you can never fix the weakest link in the chain. And the weakest link is always going to be you or me <laughs> in this instance. So uh, I always tell this story of, I know a security firm that came out, most people know about Anonymous, and they do a lot of hacking and other things. They've been in the news back, in, I don't know, for a while now, many years, and a security firm is like, hey, we're going to find these people, we're going to prosecute them, and then the very next day, their CEO is hacked. So moral of the story here is, uh, a lot of this, no matter how secure and private you think you are, someone can always get you if there's enough determination. And that's the key here is one, uh, not being an easy target, which doing these things will definitely make you a very, very small target and put a very, very small footprint. But don't ever think you're just so slick that you can get away with anything because anybody with enough determination can get at you. It's it's one thing uh, if you look at like Kevin Mitnick. I think he he's probably one of the considered one of the best hackers of all time. He says social engineering is one of the biggest tools in any hacker's toolkit. So by doing all these things and uh, making yourself more secure and private online, just know that you're always going to be the weakest link and no one is ever truly 100% secure and definitely uh, anonymous in, in this. You know, Anonymity is one of those things that has pretty much disappeared from society these days. All you can do is uh, obfuscate this as much as possible. So, uh, definitely pay attention to this. Try to do these things if you're trying to focus on security and privacy, but there always comes the, the pendulum effect when it comes to security, and that is convenience. Uh, many people have mentioned this in, in pretty much any security talk you go to. It's always this convenience over security. You can have a very, very secure system, but it's going to be extremely inconvenient because you're booting into a thumb drive, you're going ahead and having all your two factor you you got all these systems in place but it becomes extremely cumbersome for you so a lot of times that person slips up and starts writing it down on a post it note because they get tired of uh, putting it on their screen whatever it might be there's there's ways that the human body and the human mind just sabotages itself when it comes to security if it gets too stringent it, it's really important to know that so remember the balance and don't go too crazy on this scale because you're just going to inconvenience yourself and a lot of times you'll end up doing something completely silly that you probably wouldn't have even done if you just 
hadn't even done a lot of this stuff to begin with. So uh, know this scale, and it's really important to understand a lot of these things when you want to be secure and private online. But with all that said, I'm sure you're already typing feverishly down in the comments section below to let me know what I missed in this video because, man, this is a big subject. I could talk for hours on it, but for the sake of brevity and the YouTube algorithm, I'm not going to continue any more. But again, let me know your thoughts down below. And a big shout out to all my patrons. Without you, I couldn't make videos like this one. And I'll see you in the next one.